Greetings, Earthlings. Adam Savage here in my cave. Um, I have been reading lately. I didn't get a lot of, re I didn't get my normal amount of reading done over COVID. I, I'm normally working on a book all the time. Um, and somehow, like a lot of you during COVID, that just became weirdly untenable. Um, <clears throat> but I, this summer, uh, I happened upon a volume of Moby Dick and decided to dive in. And it has... I don't know why she wants to play me an episode of The Jeffersons right now, but I guess we're moving on up like George and Wheezy. I've been reading Moby Dick. You should read Moby Dick. <clears throat> it's amazing. It is also... It, it it's exhausting, but that's kind of part of the of the whole journey. Here's my impression. Um, I'm almost done. I'm like 30 pages from the end. I've been savoring it. <clears throat> Spoiler: They're with the white whale at this point. Moby Dick has an incredibly simple narrative. The narrative is they leave Nantucket. Ahab wants to get to the white whale. He tells his crew he wants to get to the white whale. We all know this. He eventually gets to the white whale. That's the narrative, but. What Melville does in Ishmael's storytelling is he fills out whaling. I mean, you, the way I've been <clears throat> imagining it is that Ishmael's like the greatest dinner companion you could ever have. It's my dinner with Andre times a million. And that Ishmael, as the narrator, is not just telling you the narrative. He's telling you all, of, obviously, he's telling you all about whaling. So there's all of these chapters about the harpoon and about the spermaceti and about the lamp oil and about different kinds of whales and what their skeletons look like and how well their skeletons match their forms. And a lot of it feels like it's, uh, I don't want to say boring because it's not boring, but you do have to give yourself over to it. It's a different structure of a narrative. And when I have, when I did give myself over to it, what I noticed about my memory of the narrative is instead of like a normal Chandler book where I think through the narrative in terms of the beat. So he met this person here and this happened there and that happened there. And I think about them as happening within this book. There's so much supporting material around the narrative of Moby Dick that when I remember the narrative, it feels like a memory from my own head. And that's kind of what I think of the purpose of all of Ishmael's ancillary storytelling in Moby Dick is about making it feel like a narrative that you were a part of. Yeah, that's the way I'm feeling about Moby Dick. Now, I also believe that one of the reasons that I'm so enjoying Moby Dick is because of the illustrations of Rockwell Kent. Um, what I understand is that in the ninth, by the 19th, uh, Moby Dick was written around 1850. Um, by the 1920s, most people apparently had forgotten about Melville and Moby Dick until a publisher put out a beautiful three-volume set of Moby Dick illustrated with 250 illustrations by American illustrator and painter Rockwell Kent. And I think these 250 illustrations are the work of a lifetime. Rockwell Kent is already an amazing artist, an incredible an incredible artist, uh, worked with the WPA, very, very um, mannerist work, very graphical, woodcut type of stuff, but a, a sensitivity of line that continues to amaze me. So these pictures augment the narrative, but the moments he chooses to illustrate are often obvious, but sometimes really weird and wonderful in terms of the perspective they give you. Um, for the uninitiated, Moby Dick is written in what feels like a thousand chapters that are all three pages long. So there's lots of beats for breathing while you're reading Moby Dick. It's not like unending blocks of text that are 40 pages long. No, no, it's like, hey, I'm going to tell you about the inside of a sperm whale's head. We're going to take four pages to do it. Oh, I'm going to tell you about the internal monologue Ahab has while walking around on the deck. Uh, and we're going to take three pages to do that. Within these chapters, for almost every single one, there's like one or two illustrations by Rockwell Kent. And the illustrations are just... They're really changing my world. Um, I'm trying to find anyone who might sell prints. Now, I know there are some companies that sell prints, but like I'm wondering if any of the original woodcuts are still extant and anyone's making prints out of them. I haven't been able to find that. 
but that's my journey. In reading Moby Dick, I came across one illustration that moved me more than any other. And it is this one. This beautiful illustration of a, of a tale of a whale upending a whaler and its five inhabitants. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Um, whale boats were in general uh, 28 to 30 feet long and had a crew of five to seven people, men. Uh, back then. And this tale is g- grossly out of proportion. Um, your standard sperm whale tale, which was one of the larger tales they would encounter back back in the day, would have been um, at its a large distance would be 16, 18 feet from tip to tip here. This boat is like 30 feet long. So this tale Oh, look, it's Moby Dick, right? We're, we're, we're recognizing that we're dealing with a monster. Just let's recognize that this is a monstrously large tale uh, compared to what it would have actually been. But this illustration, I have a desire. I saw this illustration and it woke something up and I have this desire to make this physically. I know, I've never had that desire with an illustration before like this, but I do, and I have, and I want to make this physically. There are lots of whaling kits online that you can buy, whaling boat kits. Let's be clear about a whale boat. There was the big boat that they sailed on for between two and four years to collect all the whale parts of the whales they would kill. Uh, And then there were the whalers they would use to harpoon the whales. Please understand, I consider this a barbaric and monstrous craft, and that is part of my fascination with it. This this is horrifying. What humans did to whales, absolutely like the worst thing, and I wished it had never happened. And it's not going too far to say that Moby Dick understands how horrifying the whole practice is. The book understands that. So I, I am the opposite of promoting whaling in any form. Let's just be really clear. So there was the big boat they sailed on for two to four years, and then there were the whale boats they went out to get the whale on, and that's what these were. So this was about 30 feet long. Um, In scale, here would be your person in this whaler, in this whale boat. Um, I found, this is, I think, 17th scale, 16th scale, something like that. And so I found these guys, might be 18th scale, I'm not sure, but these guys are correct. This boat is correct. And I mean, it's missing, there's a few things wrong with this clinker. Uh, This is a clinker. I think that's the term for a boat in which each uh, of its beams rests on top of the subsequent one. Um, It's missing all of its seats, all of its hardware. I want to put all that in here. Um, the gun walls are, I think, a little too wide. I think the tiller isn't right. I need to add some details up here. But the biggest issue is the whale tail and also the structure. So I want to hide structure in here. I don't know how far I'm going to get on this. I, but I want to hide some structure in here so that I can, so that this thing can look, I, I kind of want to end up with it feeling like a magic trick. I want it to feel like a physical freezing of motion so that you can't understand its structure right off the bat. Like it doesn't, like it's not super clear right off the bat. Um, the tail I am going to make using a material from my friends at Weta Workshop called Paltaya. And it will be my first time using um, what is apparently a miracle material. And I'm looking forward to it. The first thing I'm going to do in terms of structure, before I even start to, the structure is the most important part. So I don't want to spend a lot of time detailing this boat only to find that some of the details I'm adding make it harder for me to add structure. So while it is this tabla rasa, um, I am going to, uh, I am going to uh, uh, add some structure. And that structure is going to be, I'm going to add a, a, a brass spine all the way up the, uh, the, the, the keel here. Um, and then I'm going to uh, figure out where the support will come out of that spine, and then I'll figure out the next stage. And I'm going to just slowly braise this structure together, and then <coughs> once we have the structure roughly braised, uh, we will start to form and then sculpt the tail. So my goal today is not to 
finish this by any means. My goal is to just get the tail and the boat structure and uh, ready so that I can start to add some of the humans. Um, these aren't bad figures. Uh, they actually are quite poseable. Their arms, yeah, they actually, they're, they're, they're pretty gestural. I may have some issues. Yeah, see that? All right, like, I love... Look at the positions of these dudes. Look at how acrobatic they are. Oh, I just love that. So like, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna add in. I'm also likely gonna have to add structure to each of these dudes. And then there's like painting, right? Cause he's like dressed like a middle manager at like some big box store. Um, I'm gonna want him to look like a whaler. I did find, where is the one guy? I did find one guy with, with boots on which feel a little more, but at any rate, I may, the figures may require some work. I may also end up making this monochromatic, I'm not sure. All right, Struksha. Excellent, beautiful, marvelous. Let's talk about how I did this. Um, I used a couple of giant magnets to hold the gunwells down to the vise. I also have a pair of shapes underneath that are pressurizing against the gunwells. This is balsa. I didn't need a huge amount of force to carve it out, but I did need some, and I achieved it. And it fits this beautiful piece of brass really, really well. This will be the central spine holding up my boat. After a bunch of work, I've kind of gotten this to a uh, uh, to be the canvas that I want. I have thinned out the gunwells here. I'm trying to replicate an early 19th century whaling boat. Uh, I have some reference. I have some terrific reference, but I'm also going to like rely on my knowledge of scale in order to get this across. So I pulled out the inner gunwells. I'm about to add a bunch of wood hardware to add some scale. I think I am going to face the inside of this, um, much like this one is here. There we go. Oh, and uh, the brass is in. The spine has a piece of brass in it. So this can be, uh, and the piece of brass that I put inside here is square, so it registers. And um, lo, it can hold this in any orientation forever. It's really nice and positive. So the engineering of the beginning of my magic trick is working well. Um, I am going to get the gunwheels working, get the, the bow and the stern correctly laid out in terms of their hardware and their topography. Then I'm gonna clad the interior. Then I'm gonna add the benches. Then I'm gonna make the rope buckets. I'm, I'm putting all the gear in here because it's all flying out. Uh, I have ship modeling. is something I've done a little bit of, but also I have some supplies. So I have some beautiful uh, scale lumber here. These are basically 80 pieces of assorted mahogany from a seller um, on eBay. God, this is from years ago. I was into ship models. It's eventually I'm going to make some ship models. Like, that's just going to happen. I'm really specifically obsessed with cutaway ship models. And there is a possibility I may end up making a cutaway model of the Pequod, which is the whaling vessel from Moby Dick. 
I'm obsessed with it because as I read Moby Dick and I read about life in and on the ship, I find myself wanting more direct experience of what it was like. And for me, having a large scale cutaway in which I could look into it like a dollhouse and see how they lived in the boat. But I'm not going to make a dollhouse scale boat. One twelfth scale? That's like six feet long. <laughs> That's a big boat. Um, I don't know, maybe I will make it that big. This is 16th scale. And that's a great scale, but that might be, again, still too big for the, well, we'll see. Right now, I'm working on this part. It's starting to look like a respectable scale model. I'm starting to feel more of its 30 footness instead of what it was. It now seems like, yeah, here we go. It now seems quite reasonable. Does this look small? Six feet. One, two. Three, four, 24 feet. Oh, okay. Well, so if this is five feet, that's one, one, two, three, four. It's still 25 feet. These figures are too big. I'm going to have to 3D print them, I think. Yeah, you know what? These guys are too big, but um, I'm very pleased. We've got the uh, the hole here for the mast. Looks relatively straight. Um, the mast obviously gets stowed, and this is too fat for the mast, but the hole at the bottom was that, so that'll be the, anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah, this will get a coat of paint. I'll add all the wood texture later, but right now I'm going to have some burgers. When last I left you, I had finished painting my whaleboat white. I had determined that my figures might not be the right scale. And then I haven't done a thing on, on this uh, in two weeks. There's a reason I haven't done a thing on it in two weeks, and that's because the next stage is this. It's making this whale tail, and I'm gonna make it in this scale for this boat, which means it's gonna be huge. It's gonna be like, yeah, about this big and this tall. And I've been avoiding it, frankly. I'm Making a sculptural form like this feels like really high stakes to me. I want a gesture, I want a malevolent, I want a malevolent gesture out of this tail. I want, I want it to feel like it is captured mid-motion. These, these are the goals of sculptors since time immemorial. Who am I to hope that I could get one of this when I've sculpted like five things in my life? That's what my thought process has been. Um, my actual process is about to begin and that will be, I'm gonna build a foam core uh, framework and then I'm going to cover it in tin foil, and then I'm going to cover the tin foil in a uh, wetter workshop material called Paltaya, which is a uh, uh, material I've been wanting to play with for years, and I have I finally came up with a project to uh, make an excursion with it. 
<clears throat> so yes, I'm about to embark on the whale tail. That is what's about to happen. And uh, the reason that it's taking me so long is because I'm scared. I'm scared of doing this. I, I know how to push through that fear because I've been doing this for a while, but it doesn't make it any less like real, right? Um, so just a, it's a question I get a lot of like, <clears throat> there's nothing that makes me invincible from fearing a build might not go right. Um, and this is exactly the space where I'm out of my comfort zone. I'm, like, I, <laughs> am I going to learn enough about whale anatomy today to be able to make uh, the whale tail that is the gesture I want out of this sculpture? Let's see. Should we talk about this for a second? Let's talk about this. As far as um, how I'm proceeding, I don't, <laughs> I have only the barest outline of a plan. I mean, you know, I know that I want the structure to be in foam core and I'm gonna wrap this in some tin foil to give the Peltaya some body, but I haven't worked with Peltaya before. Um, if my friends at Weta, uh, uh, if they're correct, it's just a miracle material. I can't wait to play around with it. Um, but sorry, I'm talking about the structure here. Is like I, I don't have a preconceived notion about how the structure is going to work. I'm just sort of like tackling each thing in its piece. Now I've got a gesture for the tail that I like up to here. I have to trim some of this away. Right, right, right. So if this comes in. Right, this is like a tail with fins. It is a tail with fins. I know, I know! What I mean by tail with fins is that I, I, I'm learning that like the main, yeah, well, I'm gonna build that out a bit. But yeah, all right, so. <clears throat> That's pretty good. Oh, right, that's the other thing, is that there's a twist. Oh, that's that's even better if I can do that. Uh, this is soft aluminum armature wire. This is a quarter inch diameter, I believe. You can pick this up at any art store. Um, it is really crucial and wonderful for adding structure. It's not taking me too long, but it is like, it is certainly tedious in its, in the approach. I'm just continuing to like notice where I need a little bend and continuing to add it there. One little bend at a time, one little bit of topography at a time and it slowly comes together. It's just, it's about being patient. Sort of letting the, letting the piece, don't try and go too far. That way lies madness. Get you better view. Oh, hi. All right. All right. All right. 
feel like we've got something going on here. I'm liking it. That I think needs. Does it? Yeah, it does. I like that. I like it. Let's attach this in sections. Uh, if I didn't have armature wire, I could do this with coat hanger wire, and I certainly have. Coat hanger wire is a fingernail of materials. It's not too hard, not too soft, just incredible. I have to, the, the difficulty with the gesture of this tail is that I could get it wrong and everyone looking at it will still understand that it is a whale tail. But if I get it right, what it will hint at is a whale. And I know that sounds like dumbly obvious, but it's not necessarily obvious sculpturally. You could easily think narratively that it's tail plus boat equals the chaos, but the secret sauce is that unless the viewer feels like there's a whale attached to this tail, there's no violence to it. It's simply, um, what do you call it? It's a symbol of violence, but it's not the actual violence. I feel good about this phase. I think I can unplug my glue gun. I want to make this face a little bit smaller because it'll make it easier to handle. No idea how this is going. I mean, I think it's going okay, but I really have no idea. going to hit this with a little super high strength adhesive because this will help hold the tin foil down. I have no idea what I'm doing here. Once I've got this basic form, I can coat it in a number of things. I can coat it in a, a two-part epoxy clay. I could cover it in a foam clay, air dry. I could, I could coat it in Bondo, and I have in the past. Um, but at Weta Workshop, they developed this material. Where is it? Where did I put the hole? At Wedding Workshop, they developed this stuff called Paltaya. And <clears throat> Richard Taylor has built an entire model of Middle Earth out of this stuff, like a scale model where Minas Tirith is about chest high. Paltaya is a powder. You mix it with water. It creates a, apparently, I have, this is my first time trying it. Uh, it creates a putty uh, that you can sculpt. And when it's done, it dries into a weatherproof, 
super hard shell. And the recommendation is that you don't sculpt with it solid, that you make a form out of wood, foam core, tin foil, as I have done, and then coat it in like a quarter inch to a half inch of the Paltaya. Store in a dry place, about 15 minutes of soft, pliable sculpting time for basic shapes, followed by two hours of gradual stiffening. That sounds awesome. Let's give Paltaya a shot. Oh, right, it is um, mixed by volume. Four parts powder to one part water. Okay. That feels pretty good. I think I want a little more powder. Oh, oh, oh. sculptors, tell me if I'm doing this right. <laughs> My impression of the process of sculpting is get the clay roughly on the form and then start to turn it into the form that you want. Work your way around the form. Each time you work around to a spot you started in, you realize that what you did looks like shit. You keep on trying to fix it. Keep on going around. And each time I'm like, oh, this is actually turned out pretty good. Turn, nope, looks like shit. Oh, it's actually pretty good. Nope, turn around, looks like shit. And just slowly, it's slowly, slowly, slowly by increments looking less like shit. By the way, looking like shit is a technical term within making. So it's okay for kids to say that. <laughs> The Paltaya has this long working life. Um, it's got a working life for the um, for the like the clay, and then you get a longer working life on the surface. And I can actually see that. Um, I mean, I can actually still feel that this is quite soft. So I'm gonna let it sit for a few minutes. If I was doing this for a client, for real, I'd probably be looking up pictures of the anatomy of whales. I'd be thinking about the musculature inside the tail. I'd buy a visible whale and I'd look at it so I'd have some idea. I am not doing that. Um, and the question is, what is the physiology of a whale is a question I don't know the answer to, right? I mean, I kind of know what it, what it roughly should look like, right? It's got like a fat end and a skinny end with a flap at the end. You know, it's like, I understand the structure of a whale. So that leads you to the kind of, well, does it look good in and of itself? And this is this really important moment, which I loved from the Beatles documentary, Get Back, in which George says, look, we don't know what we're making and we won't know until we start to make it and then it will tell us what it wants us to make. And George is articulating the heart of the whole matter as far as I'm concerned. Because there's two approaches to this. And but to be fair, like I think a real sculptor would do them both. The first approach is what should it look like? And the second approach is, does it look like what I intended? And those are two different answers, right? Like I want some malevolence out of this tail. And it may be that there's some bit of topography on this tail that's wrong but helps communicate that malevolence, in which case it is what I want. And when you experience it, when you stand in front of this piece and you feel that, you're getting something extra. The making of things, there's no shoulds. There's is, <laughs> like a haiku, is, is, is. It's about the present. It's about your current experience with the thing. Now that slope finally looks like something that 
feels right. This one, this whole underside looks like absolute garbage. And, you know, I'm not taking it personally, but Jesus. A few years ago, I befriended Sabin Howard, incredible sculptor Sabin Howard. Look him up, S-A-B-I-N, Howard, as you would expect. Sabin is an incredible mind blower of a sculptor. I'm sure he'd be yelling at his screen if he was watching this. Ah, but he's also very generous. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm also noticing that with this big flap tool, I can I can sort of coax volumes of material. And that's really the trick towards ferreting out the wrinkles. I mean, in a way, this isn't too different from sanding. I'm sort of like, looking at the spots that stick out to me and taking care of them. But obviously it's the opposite of sanding. This is additive. This is additive uh, construction, right? The reason I'm not doing the tail just yet, the actual tail is because I want, I want this to set. I want a structure here and once I have that, the tail will be a lot easier. I'm really starting to, starting to become a thing. I once brought home a sculpture I was working on to show my dad. And it was, it was significant because like up until then I had been saying, you know, I'm a sculptor, but I had never really like intersected with my father on the aesthetics of what I was interested in. I mean, you know, he saw what I did, but we didn't talk about it a lot. I didn't bring him pieces and say, what do you think, you know? Um, but I brought this piece home. And I remember he said this lovely thing. He said, it brings its own morality with it. And that's a, that's a weird phrase, but really true about great, about great works of art. I'm not saying what I made was a great work of art, but I am saying that the thing I tapped into there was something that happens when you have really a real aesthetic solution to a problem is that it exists outside of our frames, right? It sort of takes us outside of all of our frames. I mean, Robert Piercing talked about the fact that in Zen and the Otis, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, that a deeply moving aesthetic experience both brings us deeper into ourselves, makes us more introspective, but also takes us out of ourselves, makes us more, ob gives us more, it's not more objectivity necessarily, but it's neither subjective nor objective. It is some hybrid of the two. All right, I maybe should stop fiddling with this for about 10 minutes and see what can happen when I come on back. Ah, uh, look at that, that's awful. Well, morning awakes and the villagers all wake up except for one. No, we're not playing werewolf. Look, I, I feel like this little bump is very much a kind of whale anatomy bump that feels right. It feels like I'm seeing a thing. I feel like I can feel a whale down underneath there. Uh, so, um, I am now going to cover the rest of this with Paltaya, and I'm not going to ask Paltaya to hold upside down. I think I may, I think I may do this. Got messy yesterday. Yesterday was a messy day. This is one of those parts of, um, this is one of those parts of making to keep an eye on about like addressing your work. Uh, and I say this because I'm terrible at this. I am always trying to do something while holding something in another hand and like trying to do it with one hand. Like what the, who the hell, whose time am I saving? Um, so it's just really good to ask yourself, am I approaching this? Am I approaching the thing I'm making from the right standpoint or could it be better? Paltaya is really lovely stuff. It, uh, it takes very little water to activate. 
Um, I can see it's gonna take a few days to fully harden. That's not a problem. Um, I'm really happy with the form I was able to get. I am not a sculptor, but I feel like the form I got is evocative of what I wanted to see and what I was hoping to get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm really happy with this. It is a real, it feels like a real whale tail. Um, I'm unhappy. I'm gonna cover the whole thing with Pelpaya. I'm gonna pull off all the tin foil. I just, I couldn't get it to adhere to anything close to what would feel like real structural cohesion. So I am just going to, yeah. Not even what to. I'm gonna see if I can't get this upright. I'm told that, hope that it holds its form. I think that one of the things I'm learning about sculpture is the stopping point is absolutely arbitrary. I mean, I could keep doing this for hours and hours and hours. But I am right now very happy. All right, so now I feel like I can overwork it. So I am going to stop because I think I've got it to a point of reason. <sighs> um, let's let this dry, check it out tomorrow. Well, sometimes you take a couple of weeks to let something set. Sometimes it takes a couple of months before you get back to a build. Here I am coming back to Moby Dick. Um, for you, it's just a single cut, but for me, it's already April. I think it's like th four and a half months after I was working on this. But my whale tail made out of Paltaya is, uh, is set. It's solid and I have found the generic action figures that I want to use as the sailors in this sculpture. But first, it's finally time to mount the boat uh, so that I can actually get this sculpture happening. And so that is going to be some brazing of brass coming down to the tail and then getting some structure going on inside here to hold this up. So that's what I plan to do right now is get the brass going. I'm gonna be using things that look like the hardware. So uh, I'm gonna be making some ores out of brass. Yeah, um, and in doing that, I'm gonna be then yeah, brazing them together. So, right, I need to know. <clears throat> How long a whaling oar was. 16 to 17 feet long. Quite long, actually. It took me so long to get figures that were correctly scaled. Whaling boats were about 28 to 30 feet long. Um, I'm assuming these guys are about six feet tall and that checks out exactly right. Um, oars being 16 feet long. Um, that's going to be just under half the length of this guy, which let's get that measured out. I would make the oars about nine and a half inches long. There's five sailors. There would be five oars in here. One, two, three, four, five. Um, and I want to make these oars out of brass. Yep, that is great. 
There's this interesting way in which you actually get more rigidity out of a tube than a solid bar, specifically because there's more surface area working against the bend. And this is precisely the zone in which I think that sort of happens. All right, now I think it's time to draw up what this is gonna, these oars are gonna look like. The paddles looks like it's about that tall. Five pieces like that. Oh, and you know what else I'm gonna do? close enough. One, two, three, four, and five. Okay. So, uh, uh, interesting thing. I was, um, I am now gonna move back off of this project because I just got a piece to finish a build that I'm 90% done with and I need to get it done and I'd like to get it done today. So, I'm doing that. I'm gonna pack this back up and it's instructive to show you how I'm gonna pack it back up. I'll take my ore parts. Oh, and a little bit of this guy. Then I will label it ores. Then I'll also put my figures in there. Yeah. These guys will go together and we'll move these over here. See you in another minute. Well, uh, this has been a while. I can't remember how long ago it was that I first started this or when I picked it up to restart it, but it's now time to start it again. So what I'm doing right now is uh, I have the point of brass contact into the boat. I feel like it's nice and strong. Uh, if you remember at the beginning of this video, I put in a long brass keel and brace to, excuse me, I uh, glued in a long brass keel and braised to it here. So that connection is strong. Now I am making the connection into the tail. So what I've got is a bit of uh, square brass I have blocked up the back end with some copper tape and I'm going to glue this tightly into the body of the tail and then I'm going to use some uh, CA glue to pot it in really nicely. And then uh, the nice thing about k &S brass is that it telescopes really precisely. Uh, so uh, come on, telescope really nicely like I told the people you do. Sometimes on a freshly cut edge, it's a little difficult. So there you go. So this will then be the part that comes out and I'll be able to suck it in to put this thing together. So, okay. That was a little bit of a disaster. All right, it's fixable. So uh, what the disaster I referred to is that the... Uh, the inner structure blew out when I tried to put this in, but I've potted it really nicely with uh, some uh, baking soda. And I know I have good coverage of the CA glue in there. So I'm feeling pretty optimistic about how strong this is gonna end up being. Let us uh, cut that down. If you were going to get one tool and you wanted to work with metal, you were wondering whether to get a saw or a band saw or a cutoff wheel. Frankly, there are entire YouTube economies based on things just built using a cutoff saw. Frankly, it's one of the more versatile tools in existence. Yeah, but that'll be a tool tip for another time. So uh, what I'm doing here is I already have uh, some CA glue potting the brass insert into this side. I've carved away the top here. I'm doing the same on the top. And that hopefully is gonna provide some extra mechanical holding pressure for this thing. Great, I should be able to hide that. Excellent, good. Feel good about that for now. 
here's what my research says. In a whaling ship, in a whaling boat, uh, this lineage, the boat itself, the whaler is about 30 feet long, give or take. Uh, and the oars are between 16 and 18 feet long. And uh, there are five rowing positions. There's a center one. They get the longest oar, about 18 feet. The two on either side of that, they get 17 feet. And the last two get 16 foot oars. So I am doing three different sizes of oars. Um, but they're all going to be willy nilly because you know, the whale has ruined their day. I also have to make some piles of rope. All in good time. Oh, yes, I also have to make some harpoons. Yes, I do. So, uh, I have made a slice up the middle of my oar. Uh, I plan to bring this in and braise it like that. And then I'll shape the, uh, I'll shape the neck. And I'll do that on all five of these. Oh, I can't believe you didn't get to watch that. I'm so sorry. All right. Uh, <clears throat> I've got them soldered on. They're not beautiful. They're not beautiful. But I'm going to do some shaping and some... Uh, and give the shoulders of their paddles a little more personality. Yeah. I figured out how to, so I've got the ore. See that? I was just able to do that on my 3M Scotch Bright wheel. Yeah. I've sharpened the ends of the brass tubes so that the transition is nice and smooth. Look at that. It's really lovely. You know what? I'm going to glue that in with CA glue. I'm not going to mess around. Oop. That's the thin stuff. <laughs> there we go. I know focus is an issue, but we'll get it there. Or ends, or ends all done. So now, I guess. That go? Oh, there it is. All right. So here's what I'm doing. I'm going to drill an eighth inch hole through here at the angle I want this to go. Then I'm going to slot it through there, braise it in place. I'm going to braise it because that's the strongest. And then once it's brazed in place, I'm going to trim it back. Yeah. Uh, and so hopefully it'll end up being just look like it's an oar sitting against the side of the whale. If I need to dress that with a little bit of um, rope later, I certainly can. like that. So now we're going to cut this here. Where I can see the inside, I'm going to braise into there. Yeah, something like that. That would be neat. So well, this is the end I've got and I want to trim it back, but first I want to just see how much structure, I guess. That's kind of cool. Oh, 
Sorry about that, everybody. Yeah, it's hot. I know, I know, I know. Great. Yeah. All right. So there's that. There's this. Now. I think I have made the structure necessary to hold this. It's gonna be bounciest. It's gonna be bouncy. All right, here's what I wanted to make. Here's what I made. What have I made here? It is not quite a sculpture. It's not quite a sculpture because it, there's nothing archival about this. This will not last in an abiding way. And for me, uh, while there are all sorts of different definitions, for me, uh, a, a piece of art that I would produce to be a, a thing, it's gotta be permanent. I mean, or permanent-ish, right? It's, 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 there's a level of, uh, of doneness. So what I have made here is more like the maquette of a sculpture rather than a sculpture in and of itself. Um, yeah, it's a proof of concept. And, uh, you know, I got to deal with this, the fur on the Peltai here, the, uh, the, uh, what's my, who's it? The, uh, fiber fill that makes it so strong. I'm pleased with the figures. I like how they came out. I think they're funny. I'm really pleased with the sculpture of the tail. Uh, I'm really pleased. I'm very pleased with the exercise. And that's ultimately what this was. I don't think I'm going to be making a bronze of this. Uh, it's a level of time investment and uh, energy and expense. But for right now, I've achieved a maquette of a proof of concept of my externalization of Rockwell Kent's beautiful, beautiful work. Let's do this one more time. <laughs> That's thrilling. Uh, thank you guys for joining me for this. Thanks for your uh, thanks to my editing and production team for their patience on this, because I started this months ago and it's been sitting half done while I sort of figured out whether I wanted a sculpture or a maquette. And ultimately I realized I was making a maquette. Um, and that's, 
Okay, it's actually, uh, we're not quite ready to wrap because that's worth talking about is when the scope of what you realize you're building as opposed to what you were thinking you were building changes. There's this great moment in the Beatles documentary where George says, we don't know what the album's going to be yet. We don't know until we start to record it and then it tells us what the thing wants to be. I am a firm believer that this is absolutely true. The things we make when we make them well are smarter than us and they know more than us about us. Seriously, I know it's, uh, yeah, that's genuinely how I feel. There is some tapping into a collective unconscious or consciousness itself is more collective than we know. But every everything that one makes from one's own point of view it comes out of, it's not like we draw a thing and then just make that thing. That's never, I mean, sure, yeah, you. Got, I guess you could do that. But for me, there's always this moment in the beginning when you realize you're making something different than you thought you were going to make. And if it works well, you end up miles from where you thought you were going to go. And what you end up with as a result of that is better than anything you could have conceived of. Everything you make is gonna be different than what you thought you were gonna make. You start out trying to solve a problem or a set of problems. It's always trying to solve an aesthetic problem. I mean, there's a reason you do it, right? There's a reason we set out to make something. Like, oh, I wonder if I could have that, if that would be easy to make, if that would be hard to make, what I'll learn from making that. Uh, is it possible to make that thing? Is it possible to make that thing this way? All sorts of problems to solve. Uh, and you think that, you know, you start out with a plan. Oh, I'm going to make this. And then as you start to dive into that plan, the difference between 2D and 3D leads to many, many choices. And as you make those choices, the thing that comes out of your original plan is different than you thought it was going to be because there's no way to perceive all of the possible paths and universe side that it could take. Universe side, is that really real? That is why this thing took so long because I was reluctant to admit that what I set out to make was going to be, end up being very different than the thing I wanted to make. Yeah. Um, but I'm really, I'm growing more and more pleased with the potential chaos here uh, and how it feels. Thank you guys for joining me on this. This is a, this is a, I feel like it's an open-ended build, but it's not because we've finished something. Uh, and yet, you know, um, well, for all the reasons previously stated. Thank you guys for joining me for this one day build. I'm Adam Savage in my cave. I'll see you next time.